Welcome to New Heart, everyone. We're going to praise the Lord this morning. Amen. For those of you joining us at home and here on the lawn. Heaven thundered and the world was born. Life begins and ends in the dust you form. Faith commanded and the mountains moved. Fear is losing ground to our hope in you. Unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on. Impossible things in your name, they shall be done. Freedom conquered, all our chains
day your love never fails that is you stay the same through the ages your love never changes there may be pain in the night but joy comes Psalms 33, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever the plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. 
Welcome, church. Uh, my name is Luke Peterson. This is my lovely wife, Sarah. Um, thank you for the people online, too. It's great to have both of you here uh, in, in with New Heart Church. Um, we, uh, real quick, we wanted to go over, uh, we do have uh, opportunities to have people prayer, prayer warriors we have uh, available to everybody here. Uh, we have things called connect cards. If you're new to the church, you can fill it out. If you have a prayer request, you can fill it out on the back. Um, just great opportunities to write, write what you need to, to be prayed for. And, it, 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 and I don't know if you guys have ever kept track of um, prayers um, that you guys personally do. Um, it, it's a great thing to, to do because you'll see how many prayers are answered daily, how many are small prayers, big prayers, how many prayers are get answered. Not every prayer, but lots and lots more prayers than you guys think. And it's a good opportunity to always be uh, vigilant in that. So, uh, And talking about prayer, um, we're going to get ready to uh, pray over our tithes and offerings. Um, this is for people who call New Heart their home church. If you're a guest visiting, then we're just glad you're here. Um, so pray with me um, over those. Lord Jesus, we thank you for every gift that you give us, Lord. Um, you have bountifully blessed us, um, even in times of scarcity. And as we give back to you, we pray that you would bless it tenfold, that you would bless the giver. Help us to trust in you, as that's really what giving is, is trust in you, um, knowing that you are going to take care of every need that we have. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, and you can place your offering in the back, or you can do it online as well. Um, so some of the happenings that we have going on around here at New Heart, uh, we have our dream team opportunities. If you're looking for a way to serve and to give back um, to the church, we have lots of different areas that we need help with. Um, all of this takes time. So if you like to get up early in the morning, we'd love to see you here around 7 o'clock and come and help set up easy ups and chairs. And um, if or you'd like to stay late, then after second service and help tear down, then we need that as well. Uh, if you are a patient, paperwork person. <laughs> not me, but if that's you, uh, our um, food pantry needs somebody to help once a week for an hour or so just logging stuff in. Uh, also, if you want to be a greeter and stand back and just like to smile and say hi to people, um, you can come and talk to me. We also need help with our um, audio visual team running cameras, easy stuff. Um, so if that's your niche, then we'd love to have you there as well. But we've got lots of ways that you can serve. Uh, so come and talk to anybody in those areas. Um, and yeah, that's you. Um, up on the screen, we're going to be putting a phone number um, just for updates, uh, weekly updates. We know, uh, yeah, it, it, when you call this number, I'm sorry, you text this number, I'm sorry, it's going to give you a message back what's going on with the church. Um, you know, with times being different situations like we have going on, we want to get updates from the church on what's going to be happening with the church. What are we going to, you know, what are we doing uh, this week? So the number's on the screen. Just text that. You'll get the message of what weekly of what's going to be, what's going to be happening there. Um, oh, yeah. And then uh, we, we do have Christmas still coming, even though it's 2020. Christmas is still going to be here. You know, we're still going to celebrate the birth of our Savior. And uh, we have Christmas Eve, 530. Uh, most likely it'll be here and we're, we'll look, we'll let, you know, on those updates, we'll let you know if it's going to be outdoors, indoors, we're, hopefully it's going to be indoors by then. And, uh, we'll have that uh, ready to go. And I think that's about it. Thanks a lot, guys. Well, good morning, everybody. I think my mic is on. Y'all can hear me out there? All right. Good to see y'all in the house today on the lawn. I see we, got, we moved our tents around, so more of you are in the shade. And aren't you glad last week we almost blew over in the wind? Aren't you glad there's no wind today? Praise the Lord. Uh, I say that it's going to start getting windy right now. But I'm glad to have you. Those that are out on the lawn, welcome. Those of you joining us online, welcome. We're glad to have you. Today, the title of my message is Not Shaken. Can you say those words? Say, Not Shaken. 
I might as well have named it Stand Firm because that is the idea I want to talk about today. How do we stand firm when it seems like the winds of adversity are blowing against us, when things are happening all around us that seem like they want to shake us and knock us over? And the question I ask you today is a question, not that you need to answer to me, but a question that maybe you've asked someone today, even as you've just got to church, or maybe you asked someone uh, this week, and maybe someone's asked you, and here's the question, how are you doing? Sometimes we answer that question flippantly, which is, oh, I'm good, I'm good, but the real question is, how are you really doing? How are you really doing in this season? You know, this season uh, has been a season that is, uh, it's made us, well, somewhat exhausted. Are you like me? You're sick of hearing the word that starts with C and ends with D, COVID. Are you here, sick of hearing that word? All the discussion about masks and waves. I mean, I was talking with Luke, you know, I think of waves and I think that's supposed to be something enjoyable and fun. I think of surfing, but now we're talking about these new waves of COVID-19 and all the stuff that's happening in our world. And it's just tiring, isn't it? I'm not here to keep talking about that, so don't worry. We're not going to keep talking about that. Here's the idea that, that sometimes the winds of adversity, they can shake us. They can blow us over. And I was especially thinking about that this last week as I was preparing for today. Uh, did you guys notice it was slightly windy this last week? Anyone have a notice of that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, like my car almost got blown over driving down the road. And, you know, I was thinking about this. I, I share the story in our house that we have. We're blessed with a beautiful home. And when we bought it, we moved in. The day we moved in, the backyard was filled with waist high weeds. My kids went out there and we lost them for a little while. You know, my dog went out and we lost them. We finally got them mowed down. And over the last couple of years, we've been planting things that, that are nicer than weeds, right? Uh, planting, you know, uh, we planted a garden this year. Last year, we planted some fruit trees. And I talked about my peach tree. Uh, I love that little tree. It was pretty small. We got it and we planted it. The first year I planted it, I got a couple peaches. Actually, we got one. Uh, the other ones got eaten by the squirrels. But we got one and it was amazing. This, this last May was amazing. The second year of that tree, there was hundreds of peaches on the tree. And then we had something happen something that we affectionately or maybe cursedly call the Santa Ana winds. There was hundreds of peaches and this sucker was heavy laden with fruit and those winds started blowing. You can imagine what happened. I came home one day and half of the, the tree was knocked over. In fact, some of the branches were broken and the rest of the tree was sadly leaning to the side. And it was in that moment I had to go out there and rescue my tree. I had, to, I had to plant those guy lines like we have on our canopies to tie them down so they wouldn't blow over. And then I put some wood sticks to support those branches as they were bearing fruit for us. But I was reminded of the fact that when the winds come, things blow over, right? I'm, I'm just speaking obvious stuff to you right now. There was an observation on um, a part of a Facebook group for our neighborhood. I think it's a neighborhood watch. And people were saying, man, the guys who do fences are going to have a good business day today, this last week, because things were blowing over. Fences were going over. Trees were knocking over. And I was reminded that when the winds of adversity come our way, we can either be blown over like that little peach tree, or instead we can be unshaken, unmoved. We can stand firm. We say those words with me, stand firm. Ready, go. Stand firm. We can stand firm, and I believe God wants us to have the sort of lives that stand firm, that when hard things come our way, whether they're things that, you know, they befall on us because we've done something of our own, or, or just hard things happen as it happens in the course of life, that in all circumstances, our lives will not be blown over, but they will stand resolutely, unmovable, steadfast. And so today we're going to look at the story of Paul. Those of you just joining us, maybe you haven't been with us through the series. We've been going through the book of Acts. If you have a Bible, you can turn to Acts chapter 21 today. And we've been going through the story of Acts, learning about the early church and how God used these men and women of faith. They called themselves the followers of the way and, and how God used them to impact their world. We've been looking at the life and ministry of Paul. Paul was an unlikely guy that God called and he, he was sent out to be a missionary and he planted churches all over Asia and the region of the Roman Empire. And 
the last couple of weeks, we've seen him venturing back. He feels called by God to go back to the city of Jerusalem, the city where he came from, really the, the heartbeat of the Jewish world. And he is headed back to Jerusalem, but he knows that there's going to be difficult times ahead for him. Last week, we started looking at that journey. Today, we're going to see the conclusion of it. So Acts chapter 21, I've got quite a bit of story as Paul ventures by boat from where he started and near the Ephesians, and he's going all the way back to Jerusalem. So there's a lot of, it's like a travel movie, all right? You can imagine he's going from port to port on these ships. We're going to pick it up in Acts chapter 21. You can follow along or just listen if you want to. And it says this, when we had parted from them, from the Ephesians, and we set sail in the boat, we came on a straight course to Kos, and the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patara. So they're going from port to port on their way back to Jerusalem. And having found a ship crossing to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. And when we'd come in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we sailed to Syria and landed at the city of Tyre. For there the ship was to unload cargo. So there they are on a layover. And having sought out the disciples, apparently they did not know the the believers there, but they, they looked for other followers of the way there. And having sought out the disciples, we stayed there with them for seven days. And through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go to Jerusalem. But when our days were ended, we departed and got back on the ship. We we're about to go on the ship. We went on our journey and then all with wives and children accompanied us until we were outside the city and kneeling down at the beach. Imagine this picture. All these followers of Jesus, the men, the, the women, the children, they're all together. They kneel down on the beach and they prayed and said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship and they returned to their homes. Verse seven. And when they had finished... When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at uh, uh, Ptolemais, and we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for one day. Now the next day we departed and came to Caesarea. This is the second city he's going to stop at. And we entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who is one of the seven, and we stayed with him. Now he had four unmarried daughters who were, prophe- who were prophesying. And while we were staying for many days, another prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and he bound his own feet and his own hands. And he said this, he said, thus says the Holy Spirit. By the way, if a prophet comes in your your group meeting and he says, thus says the Lord, you should probably listen. He says, thus says the Holy Spirit. Thus says the Holy Spirit, I'll find my space. This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and will deliver him over to the hands of the Gentiles. And when we heard this, we and the people there urged him, urged Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered and said, what are you doing weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, some of my favorite words, since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, let the will of the Lord be done. After these days, we went up to Jerusalem and they they went up to Jerusalem and they stayed at a house of a man named Mason. Uh, And I'm going to skip ahead a little bit of the story. They go to Jerusalem and they're trying to They're trying to make sure they don't give offense to any of the Jews. They're trying to make sure they don't cause a stink as they enter Jerusalem. We're going to pick up the story in verse 27. And they go to Jerusalem and it says, The Jews from Asia, seeing Paul in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him. That doesn't mean like they laid hands to pray on him. That means they were beating him up. They were laying violent hands on him. And crying out, they said, men of Israel, help. This is the man who's teaching everyone everywhere against this people and the law and this place. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen one of the Ephesians named Trophimus with him in the city. And they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Then all the city was stirred up and the people ran together. They seized Paul. And they dragged him out of the temple. And at once the gates were shut. And they were seeking to kill him. 
And word came to the tribune of the cohort. This is a, a, a leader of that region that all Jerusalem was in confusion. confusion. So he at once took soldiers and centurions and he ran down to them. And when they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. You imagine this picture. Paul's been falsely accused of something he didn't do. They drag him out and they're beating him up. And there's an angry mob just beating him up, trying to kill him. The soldiers get there. They finally stop beating Paul and the tribute came up and arrested Paul and ordered him to be bound with two chains. And he inquired about what he had done, but there was confusion. We're going to stop right there for now. See, in our scripture today, we've seen quite a bit. We see Paul on his journey. He's been headed towards Jerusalem for the last many days. And finally, he gets to the final approach. He goes into a city called Tyre. And there he doesn't know the believers there, but they sense there's something bad is about to happen to him. And that he's about to go face something difficult. And there's, they're, they're hoping that he won't go, but they, they prayerfully get together and they pray over him and as they send him off to Jerusalem. Then he gets into Caesarea and then very specifically God gives him a word that what awaits him in Jerusalem is not pleasure, it's not, it's not enjoyable, but in fact he's going to be bound, he's going to be arrested, he's going to be tortured for the name of Jesus, for being a follower of Jesus. And they try and convince him not to go once, not once, but twice to try and avoid this. But Paul knows this is where God has sent him to go. And so bravely he soldiers towards the direction that God has sent him. And then exactly what he thought would take place took place. And he's mobbed. And then he's arrested and bound with two chains. There's a lot that we can do when we are in Paul's situation. See, Paul knew for a couple of days that trouble was coming. That trial was going to be awaiting him. And maybe you're in a season like that. You know, man, there's something bad's about to happen. There's trial that's about to take place. I think that this scripture is perfectly timed with where we are. Many of us sense there's, there's, there's things that are not going on right in our world today. There's things that I wish I could change. There's, I, I wish I could just fix it. And when we're faced with hardships, when the winds of adversity come our direction, we can respond in one of a few different ways. Sometimes when we face those things and we think there's something scary that's going to be around the next corner, our tendency is to turn around and run the other direction, right? To say, I'm not going to go in that direction. The other thing we can do is we can check out. We can just pretend, I don't know, I don't see anything over there. There's nothing going on over there. I'll just pretend like nothing's happening. But what I believe God wants for each one of us to do is not to be afraid when we face difficult seasons. To have the sort of life that, like Paul's, will not be shaken. That no matter what we face tomorrow, no matter what we're facing today, maybe you're facing a trial, maybe you're facing adversity, maybe you're facing some other thing of difficulty today, or maybe you just feel like, man, it's about to come. Something's about to happen. That we would not be shaken. That our lives would stand firm, resolute, in the knowledge that God has given us a foundation and a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And we don't have to be afraid when the wind starts to blow. So two things I want to take away from this today because the reality is that trials will come to our lives. I'm not speaking prophetically. Don't worry, I'm not saying something bad's going to happen to you tomorrow. I'm just saying trials will come to your life. It comes to all of our lives. We face difficult seasons. And whether you're in a trial now or you're going to face one in the future, I want to give you two points on what to do when trials come. Number one, when trials come, God's people must gather together and pray. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. God's people have to stop and bow the knee before the Lord Almighty and seek His face for His healing, for His, uh, His will to be done. Now, in the city of Tyre, as Paul is headed to Jerusalem, he meets with some believers that most historians say that, you know, Paul probably didn't even know. He was just looking for other, other followers of Jesus to spend time with as he's on his way to Jerusalem. And we're reminded that, that when we're on our way to face hardships, there's something powerful about joining together 
with other brothers and sisters in the faith. Finding other followers of the way to be with, to rub shoulders with, and to pray with. There's something powerful. Because what happens quite often when we are either in the midst of trial or we're on our way to trial is we spend our time focused on our problems. We spend our time navel gazing, looking at ourselves or looking at our, watching cable news or, or, or whatever it is. It doesn't matter what the season is. We're, we're looking at other things. We're distracted by all this stuff. And what Paul understands is that when we are about to face trial, we need to be together with other brothers and sisters in the faith, shoulder to shoulder, faces towards heaven, imploring the God of heaven to meet us in our need. And this is exactly what Paul and these Christians do. See, when we are weak, friends, we need to borrow strength from a friend. We need to borrow faith from a friend. You know, we see this time and time again in the early church. We wonder, how did they endure such hardships? By God's grace, I pray that none of us will endure the hardships that Paul and Peter and all these other men and women of the faith in the early church experience. But we wonder, how did they do that? They did it together. They did it together. They had one another to be with. And and I never think of this more than when I think of the ministry of Jesus. One of the first, not the first miracles, but early in Jesus' earthly ministry, there's some some friends that, that are around their friend, and there's a man that's paralyzed. You can look it up later in Luke chapter five if you want to, but there's this guy that's paralyzed, and Jesus is teaching right nearby And he understands and believes that Jesus can heal him. But he can't get to Jesus. Because, well, for one, he's paralyzed. He can't move himself. He doesn't have like one of those cool electric wheelchairs. He's paralyzed on his mat. And for two, there's crowds of people around Jesus. So even if he could walk, he couldn't get near to him. But his friends, his friends are there. And his friends surround him. And the Bible records that he's laying on his mat and his friends pick up his mat with him on it. And they carry him. When he can't get to Jesus, they bring him to Jesus. And then they get there and they realize there's a great crowd. And I love the faith of these guys. Uh, They might be a little destructive, but they're good guys. And they go up on the roof of the building that Jesus is speaking in. And there's a thatch roof. And they start peeling back the thatch roof. They start ripping off this guy's roof. or Whoever's house it was in, he must have been not real happy about it. But, But they pull off the roof and they lower this man before Jesus. Jesus sees their faith and he heals him. He heals him. He was a paralyzed man. He's healed. But what I love about that story is the reminder that there's moments in life where we can't carry ourselves to Jesus. Maybe we're, maybe we're in the, we've hit the bottom. Maybe, maybe we're struggling with sin. Maybe there's some other circumstance, but there's times where I can't get to Jesus. And that's when I need my brothers and sisters in the faith to pick up my mat and to carry me to Jesus. That I can borrow a little bit of their faith as we gather together. And what I'm reminded of this story, I'm reminded of the fact that as a people, especially people facing trial, we must never forsake the assembly of the brethren, as the, as the old King James would have said it. We must never forsake gathering and meeting together as the church because we need one another. Turn to the person next to you and say, I need you. I need you. We need one another. We must not neglect meeting one another. I've had so many conversations over this COVID shutdown. And maybe some of you are feeling this way watching at home today. But I've talked with so many people that say, man, I'm trying to be safe, but I feel so disconnected. I just need, I need a hug. I talked with people that go visit their loved ones they haven't seen in a long time. And they said, I haven't had a hug in six months. I need to just touch someone. I need a hug. And I think this is what we're designed for. We're designed for human companionship. We're designed to do life together. There's a reason that God gives us his word, his Bible. It gives us an instruction for how to do life best. And it says we're meant to do life together. And this phrase behind me isn't just a, isn't just a catchphrase, but life is better together. We're designed for community. We're designed to do life with other human beings. It's only in the context of community I can love one another. I can love my neighbor as myself. It's only in those contexts that I can live and thrive. And I'm reminded of Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. 
that gives us a reminder on how we do life best, how we, how we maintain our faith, how we have a solid life. It says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, without being blown over. For he who promised is faithful. And he says, here's how. Let us consider how to stir one another up to love and to good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. He's saying, friends, especially when we see that the days are getting darker, and I'm not saying we need to stand on the corner with the the end is here kind of sign. Don't be that guy. But as we see that the days are evil, as we see and, and perceive the day of the Lord is drawing near, even more we must gather together and be encouraged, stir one another up to love and to good works. See, it says, how do we hold fast to our faith? It's by gathering together, by shoulder to shoulder, stirring up one another to love and to good works. See, when trials come, and they will come in all of our lives, our job is not to, not to look to the wisdom of this world, although we do want to learn the wisdom of this world. We want to be as safe as we can and, and understand, you know, all the science and all the rest of the things that are taking place in our world. We have to keep our eyes open on what's happening politically and all those things. I'm not saying we should disengage from those things completely. But none of those things are the source of our hope. None of those things can be the, the thing that we plant our life upon. We fix our eyes not on the things of this temporal world, but we fix our eyes on heaven and on the God of heaven and earth, the one who made all things. See, this is what we are called to do. We don't look to the refuge that this world provides. We look to the refuge of God. We look to the hope that is ours in Christ Jesus. I think of the psalmist, Psalm 62, 5. He writes about this sort of hope. He says, For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence. For my hope, from him it's not from anything else my hope is from him only he is my rock and my salvation he is my fortress I shall not be shaken on God rests my salvation and my glory my mighty rock my refuge is God trust in him at all times O people pour out your heart before him God is a refuge for us What is he saying? He's saying there's a temptation when things get difficult to look for hope in the wrong places. But I put my hope in God. Because this world is going to shake. It's going to rattle. It's going to roll. I'm not saying that we're going to have an earthquake. Please don't let us have an earthquake, Lord. But, But what I'm saying is that when it does, we have to have our lives anchored into something that's immovable. We've got to have our lives anchored on the rock. We've got to have a a refuge. God is our refuge, by the way. Our refuge isn't found in the political arena. Our refuge isn't found in in science. It's not found in, in anything of this earth. Our refuge is found in God Almighty. He is the one we run to, we turn to, we look to. And perhaps the most striking takeaway from this journey of Paul from Asia all the way back into Jerusalem is what takes place next in Caesarea. Uh, one of my favorite parts of the scripture, not only is he, he's he given this prophecy and there's a guy that says, thus says the Holy Spirit, dude, you're about to get locked up. You're about to get thrown in jail. Hard times are coming. And Paul says these words, I love it. They say all this stuff to him and he says, what are you doing? Weeping, you're breaking my heart. I think of it like, I don't know, I don't know why I read that in the Godfather voice. You're breaking my heart. I don't know why. And he says, you're breaking my heart. And then he says, For I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. I wonder how many of us would respond that way. You got people that love you saying, guys, dude, it's going to be hard. If you go down that road, it's going to be hard. You want to overcome that addiction? It's going to be hard. You're going to face that giant? It's going to be hard. I think of so many stories in the Old Testament and the New Testament, people saying, it's going to be a hard battle. Don't do it. It's scary. Ah, run away. 
What does Paul say? Paul says, God sent me that way. If God's going with me, then that's where I'm going. See, he understood that, that to play it safe without God is not safe at all. And to take a risk with God Almighty to go where God is directed, even when it's hard, even when it's scary, is not scary at all. It's not hard at all. Because God goes with us. He's with us in the midst of any storm. See, he said, the people said, you know, well, is it going to be easy? But Paul said, I don't care about that question. I care about what did God tell me to do? And if God told me to go, I'm going to go. I wonder how many of us would take that course. The second thing is this. When trials come, and they will come in our lives, we must never be shaken. We must never be moved. We must never be consumed by fear. And that word fear, a lot of people don't like to hear that word in this season. You calling me scared? I ain't scared. But sometimes we're gripped by fear. Sometimes we're, we're moved by fear. Sometimes fear doesn't grip us and we're not like shaking. Uh, as someone said in the last service, in the fetal position in our, in our, you know, in our closet. But we, we're directed by fear instead of by faith. And we allow the fear of the unknown to direct us more than the call in the word of God. See, I believe that the, the people in Caesarea, these followers of Jesus that lived there, I believe they cared for Paul. And the reason I believe they cared for him because they understood, Paul, you're going to go face something hard. And they're like, we don't want hard things for our friend. We don't want you to have to face that. I think that's genuine, right? I mean, we all feel that way. We have a friend. We don't want hard things to happen to them. I think, of, you know, I've got a, a small little dude in our house now. We have six little dudes in our house. But, but uh, Elias, he's tiny. And so because he's tiny, we have, to, we have to like protect him, right? And so, you know, I had a beautiful home and now I live in a prison. You know, when I want to go up the stairs, I got to open the gate and, and walk in and close the gate. And then I got to walk up the stairs to get to the top and I got to open the, oh, I forgot something downstairs. Got to close it. You know, I, I like live in a prison. And we do that because we want to protect that little dude because he's valuable and doesn't know any better. And he's, well, he's, he doesn't have it all figured out. He puts everything in his mouth. I've never had a kid do that. Puts Legos in his mouth and banana peels and, you know, he raids the trash can and puts it in his mouth. We got to protect him. So I understand that because, you know, we want to protect the ones we love. And that's what they're trying to do to Paul. But one of the things they didn't realize is that God had a call. God had a calling for Paul's life. And it sent him on this mission to go to Jerusalem. By the way, later we'd find out that it was because of Paul being arrested and because he went through trials that the church was encouraged and God used that moment to spark birth in the church and to do amazing things. But it probably didn't look that way or feel that way. But Paul had a mission. And sometimes the path ahead for your life and for mine is dangerous. Maybe it's actually dangerous. Maybe it's potentially dangerous. When I say that, I think of, I think of our the many brave men and women that serve as first responders, our police officers, our firemen, EMTs that, that rush into danger. I think of the brave men and women that served in our armed forces. Jake, if you're watching this service, think of you. The men and women that, that put their life on the line, that, that know that the path they walk may be dangerous. They don't aim for danger. They try and be safe, but they understand that the direction they're called to go might be a challenging one. And I think there's something to learn for that, regardless of what your job is, whether you're a first responder or not, whether you have a dangerous job or not. You're like, I work in an office. That's not dangerous at all. Good. But I believe there's something to learn about standing fear or standing firm and not being shaken by fear. Because the temptation is when we see our direction that, that might be scary. By the way, the unknown is scary when we don't know what tomorrow holds, that is when we go with God and we go and trust that he is in control. See, I believe, this may strike you as, as odd, but I believe that fear is a gift from God. God's given us this ability to, to sense danger. You know, have you ever seen a mama trying to protect her child, the mama bear syndrome, like they get that rush of adrenaline and they could pick up a car if it's you know, on top of their kid, they can do whatever. Like they, God's given us this ability to sense fear and danger and to respond appropriately. But God has never designed us to live in this, this bubble of fear. 
And sometimes we do that. We live constantly afraid. And fear has a way of consuming our focus. You don't believe me? Well, don't, I won't, I'll tell you what not to do. Don't turn on cable news or any news. I don't care what channel you watch. I don't care if you're watching the Fox News or the CNN or the MSNBC or even Newsmax over here or something over here. Like, it doesn't matter what you're watching. It's, it can grip us with fear. We can get so consumed with the temporal that we forget that God wants our lives to not be shaken by temporal winds that blow through. See, God says, I've given you something firm. I've given you a foundation that you can lay your life upon that will not be shaken regardless of what happens in the world. He says in Hebrews 12 that we should be grateful for receiving what? He says a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And God has given us a kingdom that cannot be shaken. He's given us a foundation to lay our lives upon that regardless of what wind comes, what storms push against our lives, regardless of what happens, regardless of how much this world huffs and puffs and tries to blow our house down. Our life can be founded on a firm foundation built upon a rock. And as I think of that, I think of Jesus' words. He said this in, uh, multiple times, but Matthew's gospel records it in Matthew 7, 24. Jesus is talking to some people and he says, people that had come to me, he said, everyone who comes to me, and then he says in verse 24, everyone then who hears these words of mine, Jesus says, and does them, this is what he'll be like. He'll be like a white man who when he was building his house, built it on the rock. And the rain fell, and the flood waters came, and the winds, they blew, and they beat on that house. His life was getting blown by all these things, the wind and the waves and the rain, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. Then Jesus says, but the opposite is also true. Those of you who come to me, hear my words and don't do them. You don't listen to They go in one ear and out the other. You don't found your life on the rock. You'll be like the man who built your life on the sand. And if you've ever built anything on the shifting sand, you know it doesn't last for long. It's going to be here today and gone tomorrow. See, Jesus gives us this picture and says, I want you to know how to have a life that's built on the rock. And you do that by coming to me. Not by fixing your eyes on the temporal things that are wrong. By spending 24 hours a day watching Newsmax or watching Fox News, or watching MSNBC, or watching whatever news you're watching. It's also not by saying, oh, forget that, I'm just going to watch Netflix, and just turn my brain off. But it's by fixing our eyes on Him, that when we're worried, when we're anxious, when we're, when we're shaken, the wind is coming, that we found our lives on the rock. Because that will not be shaken. See, our lives are built on the rock when we come to Jesus when we listen to his words, when we do what he says, and when we trust in his word. See, this world is pushing, prodding, provoking all the time. I don't have to tell you about it because you can probably give me a hundred examples. But this world does that. And God's people must not be shaken. As God's people, we must not be moved. As God's people like Paul what a great example. We must not be persuaded to go in and just, well, just go run the other direction. Today, friends and fellow followers of the way, I'm asking you to stand firm. I'm asking you to not be shaken, resolving to stand with your brothers and sisters in the faith that as Paul did, to go shoulder to shoulder, to bringing your problems not before not before the law, not before someone else, but to come and do as our founding fathers, they had a phrase that I love. In fact, the man by the name of John Locke coined this phrase. That when we're, we're going through things, sure, let's appeal to the law and let's appeal to this and let's appeal to man, but let us not forget to, and this is the phrase, to appeal to heaven. And they actually had a flag that was, they, they made that was designed to, to, to remind folks of that. 
that our job is, yes, let's appeal to law and let's, let's do the things we need to do. Let's, let's, you know, wash our hands and take care to, you know, not spread this virus and all the temporal things we have to do. But let us never forget to appeal to heaven. Let's never forget to be like the brothers and sisters in Tyre who, though they didn't want to see their friend face something hard, they said, before you go, let's, let's bow the knee before the king of kings and appeal to heaven and invite God into our circumstance. And so friends, I'm, in, I'm in encouraging you, I'm exhorting you, appeal to heaven. Walk with your brothers and sisters. Let's not forsake gathering together. Let's meet together. Let's pray together. And let's walk together. Because here's what I know to be true. That when we walk in the direction that the Lord leads us, though it may not always go exactly the way we expect, when we go with God, we have the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. And the protection of God is with us. And the blessings of God go with us. I want to close with a scripture from Psalm chapter 91. You can listen to these words. And this is my prayer over you, you that are here on the lawn, you that are watching at home. Psalm 91, starting in verse 1, says this. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. Church, will you bow your heads with me as we respond to the Lord in prayer? Father God, we thank you for your word. God, I thank you for Paul, who is to us an example of faith. Not that he was perfect, but when times were difficult, when the winds of adversity started blowing and they came near to his life, he didn't run. He didn't hide. He didn't check out. He didn't quit. But he pressed forward. He stood firm. He was not persuaded. He was not moved. He was not redirected. And God, I pray that over your church today. God, it's you that we trust. We look to you, Father in heaven. We appeal to you, Father in heaven. Use your church in this season of darkness to make a difference. All the more as the day draws near, may we as your people stir one another up to love and to good works. May we find refuge in you alone. And God, may you shelter us under the shadow of your wings. And God, may you use your church in this season for such a time as this to be a place of refuge for the hurting, to be a place of, of relief for those that are scared and broken. Help us to stand firm. God, I pray for any area of our lives, maybe there's areas of our lives that feel shaken right now. Maybe we've laid a foundation underneath us that's not, that's not the rock, but it's something else. Today we choose to plant our lives on the solid rock, trusting you in everything. So God, I pray that when trials come, you'd help us to gather around with one another, to, to seek your face together. We appeal to you. And Lord, maybe we're facing a trial right now. Maybe we know someone who is. God, I pray that we would not be shaken by it, that we wouldn't be moved by it, that we wouldn't be consumed by fear in the midst of it. God, I pray for every man and woman listening to the sound of my voice. I pray that you'd give them courage, that you'd give them steadfastness, that you'd make us, give us a measure of the, the confidence that Paul had in you. Give us a measure of that today. We want to be bold for you. And with every head still bowed and eyes still closed, perhaps you're within the sound of my voice and you've never made the decision to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. 
See, we can only put our life on that foundation if we've received him as Lord, as Savior. If that's you today and you've never done that, the Bible's clear. It says in the book of Romans, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It says, for with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. And so if that's you and you've never made the decision to to make Jesus Christ your Lord, you've never been saved, or you've walked far from God, you say, it's time for me to come home. If that's you today, within the sound of my voice, I want to pray with you. It's about a conversation between you and God. You can pray this prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I thank you for dying on the cross in my place for my sins. I believe that you were raised from the dead and in so doing, you give me the gift of eternal life. Jesus, I wanna follow you wherever you lead me. And I put my trust and hope in you as my Lord and as my Savior. In your name, Jesus, I pray, amen. Amen. Church, can we celebrate the Lord this morning? Well, church, that's my prayer for you. I want to encourage you in this season where things will shake us, don't be shaken. My prayer is that the Lord would, would encourage you with this word that you wouldn't fear, but you would stand firm. God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you guys next weekend.